things are getting strange next as we watch podcast i'm nick and i'm kim and i do believe we have some form of news i do have news hooray stranger things have happened well things are getting strange hey. Hey. so shameless plug as we mentioned at the end of all of our podcasts uh we have a patreon if, if you sign up to that you get access to podcasts and let's plays and just various things that aren't available anywhere else unless you are a subscriber. I recently contacted Kevin J. Anderson, who wrote a few of the X-Files novels, just because I had some questions for him, and if you want to find out what I asked him, sign up to the Patreon and listen to the Ground Zero episode and you will find out. Mr. Anderson also asked if I would share something with our listeners, and that's the fact that if you go to his store, he has a sale on at the moment where for $15 you can get signed physical copies of the three X-Files novels he wrote. So that's Ground Zero, Ruins and Antibodies. Very cool. Yeah, I actually sent for some for us as well. Ah, that'd be nice. So I have posted a link to this on the Things Are Getting Strange Twitter. That's Get Strange 42 at Twitter. But there are only limited copies available, so if you want to secure some for yourself for definite, visit his website. It is www.wordfireshop.com forward slash product forward slash x hyphen files hyphen thrillers and you can get your own for fifteen dollars so it's actually really good value just for the books let alone them being autographed but when you order them you must have patience Eh. Eh. directed and written by chris carter carter (laughs) damn our first broadcast on the 19th of november 2000 guest stars one of these took me completely by surprise all right So, Eve Brenner plays Mrs. McKesson, who was in Dead Like Me, Seinfeld, Star Trek Voyager, and Next Generation. Oh, okay. There's Gary Bullock, who played Tall George. I think that's the husband who died at the start, but I'm not sure. Oh, could be, yeah. Who was in The Handmaid's Tale film. Robocop 2 and 3 as completely different characters. Okay. Twin Peaks Firewalk With Me. Species, Star Trek Voyager and Enterprise, and Buffy the Vampire Slayer. But now the good one. So... Eugene Dianaski played uh, Ernie Stefaniak. Okay. Who was also in Star Trek, the original series and Next Generation. Close Encounters of the Third Kind. Command and Conquer at Alert. <laughs> I would like to guess who he was. Go on. Joseph Stalin. <laughs> <laughs> if you're going to play a role, I guess. <laughs> well, yeah, it's him. There are a few other historical ones, but it's not like your Tim Curry saying, I'll go to the only place that capitalism can't find me. Space! There's also Bradford English, who played Yale Abbott, who I think is the police detective. He was in Basic Instinct, Halloween, The Curse of Michael Myers, Seinfeld, Cheers, Frasier, and it keeps coming back, Dark Skies. <laughs> there is such a crossover between these series. Not surprisingly. And Brent Sexton played the Gravedigger, just the Gravedigger, who was in AI, Vanilla Sky, Angel, and Third Rock from the Sun. So, can you give us a synopsis of this episode? If you wait a bit, maybe. You mean if I'm patient? Ooh, yeah. In Burley, Idaho, an undertaker and his wife are brutally murdered by some sort of flying creature. Scully explains about the death and explains the cause is blood loss from human bite marks on their bodies. Scully and Doggett arrive at the crime scene and meet Detective Yale Abbott. He says they are less sure that the bites were made by a human and draws their attention to the strange footprint, believing that wild animals fed on the bodies after the fact. Scully points out there is only one footprint which looks ominously human and that if it were left by an animal, there would be more footprints leading to the bodies. Scully and Doggett check the house and find prints leading upstairs and into the attic. Inside, they find the missing fingers of the Undertaker. They look like they have been regurgitated by something and the claw marks in the attic suggest that something was hanging from the rafters. Meanwhile, elderly Mrs. McKesson is killed in her attic while looking at a photo album. At the morgue, Scully explains that she studied the bite wounds and discovered they are similar but intrinsically different than human bites. The saliva on the regurgitated fingers has anticoagulants in it, which are only bats having the saliva. Doggett finds the evidence interesting, and due to the newspaper article he brought Scully, in 1956 a series of deaths was reported that ended when a group of hunters killed a man-bat creature and brought it to the county morgue in part of Montana. The coroner said the creature was neither bat nor man. He was then killed a few days later, and soon after, more people were killed or disappeared. Scully and Doggett joined the investigation at McKesson's home. Scully suggests a connection between the burned body of Ariel McKesson, who disappeared in 1956, and her mother, the latest victim. Scully believes the burned body should be exhumed to potentially learn the connection with the other deaths. Later, the gravediggers already have the coffin excavated when Detective Abbott shows up at the town cemetery. They tell him that they did not have to dig because someone had already dug the coffin up, 
and scratch the lid. While they drive off with the body, Abra inspects a dead tree and discovers the creature within, and it soon eviscerates him. The police are upset about Abra's death and blame Scully, while Doggett reminds them that the only thing that killed Abra and the others is to blame. Scully explains Ariel McKesson died of heart failure and then was burned to cover something up. She realises that all the victims were people who came into contact with the body of Ariel McKesson. Abra investigated the crime, her mother identified the body, the undertaker prepared the body, and Myron Stefaniak pulled the body from the river. All but Myron Stefaniak are now dead. Doggett and Scully find Myron and ask him about Ernie Stefaniak, one of the hunters from 1956, who he reveals disappeared a long time ago. The two eventually track down Ernie Stefaniak, who tells them that he hid on an island in the middle of the town's lake with his wife Ariel for 44 years. Ernie says the bat creature kills anyone with any scent on them, so he had to burn his wife's body to try and cover up the scent. He informs them that it only hunts at night and that Myron is in danger. Doggett goes back to find Myron, only to be attacked and badly torn up by the creature at the river. Ernie says Scully is now marked and the creature will go after her too. When his ground radar goes off, Scully goes outside. Ernie stays inside and is butchered by the bat creature. Scully returns to see it ravaging Ernie and she manages to shoot it before being knocked down. Doggett appears and shoots the creature several more times, saving Scully. The creature disappears into the night, while Scully helps the injured Doggett. Back at the office, they get a fax from Myron, who survived and has gone into hiding in Wyoming. Thank you. It's the weird first case to give Doggett. Oh, you think? The man bat? The man bat, yes. I'm, I am mystified that no one, and I mean no one, cracks a Batman joke the entire time. Apparently that was the inspiration, as you may not be surprised to hear. I'm not surprised. Is the fact that is a Batman villain called Man Bat who yeah. looks like this creature. I mean, maybe again it's the whole difference in pop culture, but you can't imagine anyone not alluding to Bruce Wayne, Robin, just Gotham City, just talking around this somehow. Mm. I mean, why isn't this set near Chicago or something? Or even, we don't really mention vampires at all, despite the fact they make that connection to vampire bats having um, anticoagulants in their bites. That's true, yeah. We but don't there's no kind of, like, Van Helsing sort of reference or anything like that. No, it's really odd, isn't it, that they just seem to be ruthlessly avoiding anything. We do have Scully really sort of leaning into her role as believer and... I don't know, is it good or bad that she doesn't feel ready to do it? She's kind of forcing herself to be the Mulder in this situation now. But when people ask her too many questions, she just has to sort of vamp for a bit and try and come up with something. But at the same time, she's not trying to be Mulder, because you have that lengthy scene at the start where she won't let Doggett use Mulder's desk. It's true. But then again, she's also... As soon as they get to the crime scene, it's a case of, uh, oh, I don't think it can be human or animal, or it must be human because of X, Y, Z. But then when they press her again, she just can't. She runs out of things faster than Mulder would have. Yeah. She evidently doesn't have the strength of Mulder's convictions where you cling to the lunacy until the bitter end. Yeah, and insist on nonsense. At the same time, Dog has apparently just read through the entire backlog of the X-Files. I guess it's just kind of showing that Doggett is taking this seriously. Yeah, which is quite a surprise, really. I mean, it doesn't feel like his speed at all. No, and indeed it's Doggett that actually finds the evidence of man batteredness because he comes up with that newspaper he's found. Yeah, and I think that's kind of the, the weirder part of it all, isn't it? It's, I think we're braced for Doggett to actually resist a bit more than he is, but he turns up this uh, news article and just believes it wholeheartedly. It feels kind of weird that we branded Doggett last time as the knee-jerk sceptic, but yeah, I have a photo here of an obvious man bat. This has to be real. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely hanging from the rafters inside this house. It's bitten off someone's fingers and regurgitated them, just like it did in 1956. And I'm not gonna... He also doesn't quibble about the, um, you know, tracking down anyone who's had any contact with the thing that killed or injured the previous man bat. Which I do think is one of the things the episode never gets into is, is this the same creature? Is it the centre of the creature? What's going on? Well, we've talked about evolutionary pulls before, I think, in that Scully kind of goes into that, do they call it the flying primate theory? The idea that, you know, like we have evolved from monkeys, yeah. you know, or the evolutionary kind of forerunner to monkeys. Or the... Kind of similar mammals could have also evolved into humans, like bats. Oh, okay. But to have any kind of surviving species, you need a breeding pool. Yeah. You cannot just have <laughs> one of these things. 
you need to have like I don't know, it's something like three hundred pairs hmm. to survive a race. You know, any time a species drops to under three hundred pairs, it's likely to go extinct. Yeah. So where is our huge manbat colony? Which, which is apparently in Idaho somewhere. Yes, which then kind of points to it only being one since they thought they killed it at the time and it got back up again. My feeling is that this is supposed to be Doggett's tombs. Yeah, although it ends quite differently to tombs because they tombs didn't get away. They had him at the end there and they knew something weird was wrong. There was something weird about him. Also, yeah, he totally tried to kill Skilly. But if you're looking at the framing of the episode, it very much is like tombs. You have a creature that awakens every X number of years to kill so many people and then apparently goes into hibernation for a while again. Yeah, and just, is it a level of intelligence or is it sloppy writing that it just doesn't kill Myron? Good point, yeah. <laughs> that then implies there's a level of intelligence that we just don't actually grapple with, that he knows, don't kill this guy because he's your only lead to Ernie, the one you actually want to get. Yeah, true. And, um... Quite why you wouldn't leave the area as well, though. <laughs> it strikes me as a bit of a weird one. I'm going to isolate myself on this island in the middle of the lake and cut off all contact, but not leave the area. An area with no big trees would be a good start. Yeah, that's a, that's a definitely a good start. I do like the fact that Scully has said, you know, while I'm not going to be Mulder per se, I'm going to take on Mulder's role. So I'm going to put together a slideshow. And I do feel there's also a bit of final litigation about the series because it's uh dog comes into the office and, say, and says oh where's my work area because there's, there's one desk in here and yeah we're going to get to that whole scully doesn't have a desk like never again pointed out and by the end of the episode she's promising to get dog at a desk so wow we've actually progressed I'm wondering how they're going to fit more desks in that room wasn't I... that kind of Mulder's argument previously is there isn't room in there yeah but i think also he's got his desk at an awkward angle if you sort of put it like perpendicular to one of the walls rather than diagonally you'd actually be able to fit more things in there easier yeah true he has just put it in the most awkward way he can so that was interesting and i did think as well there's are the fbi just really shallow or is was there more animosity towards Mulder than we knew just because there's that scene of when dog first arrives in the office and scully is there he's got the two giggling friends with him apparently they want to go and look at Mulder's the weirdo's office. Yeah. But you've all apparently worked here for a while. John Doggett didn't just become an FBI agent, did he? He's been an FBI agent for a long time. I'm not sure why Mulder is um, a fascinating thing for other FBI agents to see, other than did Mulder, like, did, if you came by the office when Mulder was there normally, would he just chase you off with a broom or something? Possibly. I think the very fact that Mulder was in there probably would have meant that nobody was going around having a mooch and a giggle at the X-Files. Well, true, I suppose. When you've got him literally in there all the time guarding the file cabinet. <laughs> Didn't stop the alien bounty and stealing stuff, though, did it? I don't think this is a, a bad episode. I don't think it's a great first one for Doggett either, though. Apparently what Carter was trying to do was to get the feeling of the first season again which had a number of kind of very varied back-to-back -back Monster of the Week episodes, and he wanted a similar introduction to Doggett as we got to Scully. Yeah. yeah. There's no reason why you can't do that. It's just, I don't know, I think it's your point of Doggett digging up the newspaper article. Is I think Doggett, does he believe if you if you find something with it written down, he'll believe it, which means you could plausibly just slip him like the Majestic 12 files and he'd believe those without question. Yeah, true. It just it feels a bit odd to just believe this um, very weird uh, newspaper clipping from the 50s. Like, this is the time, you know, when the Roswell crash was reported. And, and also, if we think back to the likes of Humbug, where we learnt about gaffes, this yeah. is something that in a photograph you could falsify very easily. You know, a just something, a dead monkey you've made up to look like a Batman. Exactly. I mean, <laughs> there's no way of knowing that was a genuine thing. Because, again, yeah, if hunters are sort of posing with their trophy... You can't tell anything. Oh, no. And you can never get scale in pictures like that. Like the ones you see of people kind of making the creature they've fished up look way bigger than it actually is and things like yeah. that. There's a really famous shot with a hunter holding a, you know, three foot long grasshopper that's all done through perspective. Yeah. You know, made to look like, you know, whereas it's just a normal sized grasshopper that's been photographed, it's been photographed in such a way that it looks like a man's holding an enormous one. Yeah, there are, there are various ways of doing that perspective this is how lord of the rings was done for the majority for a lot of it yeah 
I had a feeling when I watched the episodes that they kind of toyed with and then very quickly gave up on sexism in the police force. Yeah. Because when they first go to the crime scene, they, they definitely play it like the guy doesn't want to talk to Scully and is trying to address everything to Doggart. And they, basically, as soon as that scene's over with, that aspect of the episode goes away because it's yeah. not being relevant. It's really odd. It's more they become aggressive to both of them after the police chief dies. Yeah, there's no talking down to Scully or anything. I mean, you do get that one bit where Dogger gets the body exhumed because he says something to the police chief. And the next episode will make a big thing of Dogger being open and honest with Scully as much as he can be. But you do have to wonder what if he murmured something about the house, he's just lost someone, and that was part of what gave them the edge to get this done for her. Because he was refusing point blank at first, wasn't he? Yeah. So Dogger's characterization actually feels kind of weird in these two episodes where we're still trying to nail him down. Which is kind of odd given you think you'd have a better grasp on that by this point. Yeah. No, that's a very good point. Especially if he's going to be your new leader. Again, I think this comes back to our, our evergreen point of does it, we know there is a show Bible, but I don't think they look at the thing. Because <laughs> presumably there's got to be an entry for Dogger in there. Yeah, one would assume so. <laughs> well, I... I assume yes i'm not convinced it's true if anyone whoever worked on the x-files exists i mean if you've got a copy of this thing we'd love to see it because <laughs> it's the kind of thing that you don't get they do these things don't get published sadly no but it'd be great to actually see what the x-files would look like i mean a lot of tv shows i'd like to see what the actual document looked like given that it's usually got reams of stuff that never makes it in yeah it's like background and sort of uh, consistency notes that people apparently don't read well, it's something they say about creating characters for novels is that you don't have to say everything, but you have to know it. Yes. Because it kind of feeds into how you write the character. Yeah. At the same time, I have also seen advice recently of you don't have to do what Tolkien did in terms of world building. Yeah. There is definitely a case for it being you only have to know as much as it gets onto the page. You don't have to do the rest of it because that's a staggering amount of work for very little payoff most of the time. But yeah, Doggett's characterization being slightly all over the place is um, an odd choice. When you look at the critical reviews for this episode from the time, they are surprisingly polarising. What is it like, your reaction to Doggett, of um, he's replaced David Jacobini, I don't care for this man? It's actually less for Doggett in this instance. Okay. There are some critical points that fans have made about Doggett for the next episode we'll talk about today, Roadrunners. Yeah. But for this episode, it was more kind of... Talking about the feel of the episode and the monster design is what the critics got hooked up on. So uh, on one end of the scale, you have the likes of Jay Anderson from What Culture, who talked about how dark and creepy the episode is and how scary he found the monster to be. Uh, I'd go kind of unnerving and some of the quick shots of it are, are nicely ambiguous because you're not sure what you're looking at. But overall, I didn't think finding the episode that creepy this time around. And the only real reference I could find to Doggant was, again, Sherman and Peterson, the Are Wanting to Believe guys, who gave it a kind of middling review of the episodes. They were my middle-of-the-line ones for this. But they said that one of the things that worked is that the scenes between Doggett and Scully were good. Yeah. And that maybe if this had been a Mulder and Scully episode, it would have been bottom of the barrel, but <laughs> for a Doggett and Scully episode, it was a good introduction. Yeah. Oh, yeah, I mean... It's interesting then that Carter said he wanted to get back to the series one feel because for most things you'd be saying, we've been here, done this, why are we going backwards? But then we have the other end of the scale. <laughs> so we have uh, two usual people I quote for these, Emily van der Veff from the AV Club and Paul Vitaris from Sin Fantastique, yep. two of my favourite reviewers who I generally think are very fair. But van der Veff called the episode bland and generic and said that the kind of creature itself was just plain ridiculous, I think. By this point in the X-Files, I don't think you can accuse the man-bat of being any sillier. I'm trying to think of the, the other least, most ridiculous creature we've had. Maybe maybe the, the trash monster, if you've had a trash monster. Oh, the one from Arcadia. Yeah, once, you, once you've had tulpas and trash monsters, mm. I think reasonably pretty good practical prosthetics and everything. I mean, it doesn't. it's not clearly a guy in a suit kind of thing, is it? I don't know. I think it very much looks like a thing in the suit. Uh, the bat monster, in my mind, looks like something I'd expect to see on Buffy the Vampire Slayer. It's very latex demon sort of look to it. True. But then it's the kind of thing where you sort of, in the defense of like the old Toho Godzilla films, and even the newer ones, it doesn't matter, it's a guy in a suit, it's the spectacle is what you're here for. 
Yes, but do you get the spectacle in this episode? Well, if no. <laughs> you're looking at the old Toa movies, say King Ghidorah, which is physically there on the stage, but it is an immense puppet operated by three people. Yeah, I know. Compare Bat Monster. <laughs> Again, I'll take the Buffy um, example then, because I don't think it's a different tone to the X-Files, but it's not outside the realms of acceptability, I think. Given these two things were in production at the same time. Well, I raise you Paula Vitaris, who I have yeah. quoted here saying, a dull monster in fakey-looking makeup. <laughs> Fair enough. I mean, I, I don't think consistent monster is the be-all, end-all of an episode. I, I don't think it's a good look. I, it's a monster that makes no sense, as we've said. <laughs> oh, no. We don't know its evolution, how it can survive 50-year spans if it is one creature, which you've got to assume it is because... It's somehow, its senses are so astute, it can remember a smell for 50 years and track these people to the ends of the earth. And just from vague contact with other people as well. Yep, it will still attack. So it's not smart enough to kind of differentiate the one person that hurt it, but it is smart enough to track down anything that bears a vague resemblance to them. But still is my own life. <laughs> and will track them across state lines as well to yeah. other states. And also, I will go with the ridiculous nervous stuff. This thing can apparently fly. There is no way in hell that thing would be able to fly. <laughs> this is movie dragon logic of that thing would not gain lift. That's true. The comparison to Squeeze is an interesting one, given it kind of feels a lot like we're redoing season one again to a point, but Chris Carter's doing something weirder than before. Because the, the point in season one we made is Morgan and Wong generally... The best writer, one of the, one of the best groups of writers the X Files has ever had. Never again as one of the weird outliers where that was just thought of really not their best work. Mm. Wrote Ice, the thing inspired claustrophobic psychological panic thing in the near the Arctic Circle, parasitic worms. You, who do you know how to trust? And we observed with Darkness Falls that Chris Carter basically said, "Boy, I can do this," mm. and did Darkness Falls, and that was fine. Yeah. So, extrapolate out this way then, is this is the third episode of season eight. The third episode of season one was to, or Squeeze, sorry, which is written by Morgan and Wong. So Chris Carter has looked at Squeeze and said, boy, I can do this again, copied Morgan and Wong, and produced Patience. Yeah, good point. But has lost any way of understanding or executing how Morgan and Wong work again? Because he seemed to get it in season one. He's lost that ability now. I think you have, if we're comparing the uh, Mambat, as we keep calling it, to Tombs, Tombs is a lot more frightening. Yes. Tombs is intelligent, calculating, and utterly vicious. Yes. Well, I think the other thing then he's missed is the terror of Squeeze, which I think Mulder does exemplify at one point, is it's the impossible locked room scenario. You don't know how he got in there. You're meant to be somewhere safe. Mm. And that's just not a factor in patience at all. No. This thing does have physical limitations. Yeah. It has to have clear access to you. It can't just squeeze through gaps. Although, oh, okay. So there's there's a bit where uh, Eugene goes to the fireplace and tries to light the fire and lights the match. There's nothing in the chimney and yeah. turns on and it's behind him. Yeah. Wasn't this a scene in Tombs? Squeeze even, sorry. I keep saying the wrong way around. The second victim in Squeeze, he comes home. And he see, lights the fire. Vi Tombs has come down the chimney, and you think he's going to be in the fireplace. He's not. He lights the fire, and Tombs grabs him from behind. Yeah, true. This is just Squeeze. Yeah, really that's is. what I've been saying. Yeah, but, I mean, no, even to down to specifics, it's just Squeeze again. I think you have the idea, again, of people being attacked within their own, own homes. But it's not the great mystery of Squeeze, it's the fact that their homes seem to be quite ramshackle. Yeah. Like the bit where it gets the woman in the attic, you see, you know, there are holes in that roof and stuff like that above her, so it's obvious how the creature can get in. Yeah, it's kind of like, I want to redo Squeeze, but I don't understand why Squeeze was horrifying. Mm. Or why it was actually a very tense, very scary episode to throw on your audience who've had two episodes of UFO stuff. I found it when I'm even talking to non-X-Files fans, like people at work who can remember watching it. The episode everyone remembers is Squeeze. Yeah. It's really, really scary and it burned itself into people's minds. And if people can't remember anything else about the early seasons, they remember Eugene Victor Tombs. Yeah. And I've got to wonder, ultimately, while Chris Carter is showing it, should be able to take that as the whole, the whole project is his baby. Mm. 
is there something in the back of his mind saying the thing everyone remembers is not one of my episodes it's not the pilot it's not one of the conspiracy episodes it's the liver eating serial killer from episode three written by morgan and wong those jerks who ran off came back and ran off again mm. who we do we know for it's one thing we have to get into for season 10 we know one of them comes back but not both of them it also goes into the kind of psychological horror and what is scary because as a sane adult, you make horror movies less scary by knowing you're at no risk. Yeah. So it's like the It Follows effect of, you know, it only attacks people who are having sex Yeah. and all the rest of it. So, you know, that puts you in a frame of, you know what you would do that would put you in danger from the creature. Yeah. In this Batman one, you know you're only at risk if you smell like this one particular person. If you've come into contact with this one body, that's what's putting people at risk. Yeah. In Tombs, literally anyone is at risk. Yes. And you're not safe in your own home. Yeah. And that's why he's scary. And I think both Squeeze and Tombs make clear that he goes through something that looks a lot like the aura phase of serial killers, mm. always from his point of view. But we don't understand what that, why he's picking these people out. Yeah. He's just staring at people in the street and we don't understand how he's picking them out at all. It's the fear when you're alone at your house by yourself is you have nothing to fear from Man Bat. You don't know that Tombs <laughs> hasn't marked you earlier that day and is currently kind of slowly unscrewing a ventilation shaft to get in with you yeah i mean i this also put, puts me in mind of people used to find the alien series absolutely petrifying hmm. as you said it's that level of abstraction where i'm not in that time period because that's in the future that's on a spaceship on another planet with an organism that bears no resemblance to anything we actually have in the, in the actual real world and as you say isn't on earth even isn't even on earth so the actual terror levels of the alien are it's to be fair to Alien, it does actually do dread the first time you watch it quite well. I think Alien works when you don't know what to expect, which is a problem these days when everybody does know what happens in Alien. Well, a lot of people have said it's the problem with the Alien creature itself is that we are too familiar with the thing. Mm. As we record this, Alien Romulus is next month. We're, do, we don't know that Buzz is positive, but the po Buzz is positive on the last few, so we don't know whether it's going to work or not. But... If it's going to be a kind of horror, it can't do creeping dread. It's going to have to be jump scary action horror. It can't do what Alien did again. No. It's too much in the pop culture. We know what the thing looks like. It was terrifying when you didn't know what it looked like. And never got a clear shot of it. But we have so much art. We can buy action figures of the Alien. That really diminishes its horror. And it was the limitations of the original, where it's always a man in a suit in very poorly lit closed spaces. Yep. Whereas now they CGI the things, and we've seen movies with whole hordes of them running yeah. side by side. <laughs> Which is good for the speed, but it's like uh, the interesting note of that was always Ridley Scott when they were doing the first test runs of the alien in costume. Mm. Someone said, now run, and Ridley Scott just put a stop to it and said, never going to see it running. It's yeah. going to be posing. It's always going to be artfully presented on screen. And that's why, if you watch the original version of Alien and the director's cut, one of the things that's missing is a shot of it dangling outside the shuttle. Because for the first time, it looks like a guy in a suit. Yeah. Now compare uh, the man <laughs> back here yeah. and the scene where it jumps on the back of the police sergeant and it looks like it's just been shot from a cannon from the side <laughs> of the screen. Yeah. Because, of course, we couldn't get a realistic picture of this thing in flight. No. And again, you can sort of say TV budgets and everything else, but I think Buffy might have been able to work around this a bit better if you gave them the man bat. Buffy had very rubber demons, but again, you don't see the rubber demons doing much movement, much kinetic combat like that or anything similar. I was saying, the other, well, the other thing I feel, though, to contrast the two of them, is Buffy, as much as it led into horror, was very largely comedic for a lot of its runtime. It got serious at points, but most of the time it's going to be there was the opportunity for humour regardless of what was going on. Thinking of the lines of Willow's robot demon boyfriend and things like that. Yeah, or anything Spike says after season four basically turns into humour. Yeah. So it's that kind of... That, but that Buffy would have lent into the fact this looks kind of rubbish. I mean, it'd be like the Dracula episode where they're making fun of the fact he's, you know, a completely typical Count Dracula. Oh, some of my favourite ones were early season Xander episodes because you had things like Where Hyenas and the teacher who turned out to be a giant praying mantis and that sort of thing. There are always things played for laughs at his expense. Yeah, and I feel we should. there's a something to be done to go and look at how much was early Buffy compared to early X-Files, given that Buffy started slightly later, 
But you've got to wonder how much of Buffy's whole ethos was informed by doing sillier takes on how the X-Files was operating at the time. Yeah. It much more gracefully did its arced plot than the X-Files ever did, because it's dealing with fantasy stuff all the time and only occasional sci-fi stuff. Mm. And even the sci-fi stuff was actually ultimately fantastical anyway. Yeah, true. We've diverged quite often. I mean, I, don't, I keep thinking this episode is great because there's not a lot to talk about and a lot of it's on the, the special effects are kind of rubbish and there are, there are things they could have done and just didn't. Maybe I also think it's because we know so little about the Bat creature and it apparently cannot communicate either that a lot of what they kind of assume about the Bat creature is complete hearsay. Yeah. And we don't even end it with a sting like, say, Jersey Devil, where we discover there's actually a whole family of these things or anything. As far as we can tell, it is just it. Yeah, and we've got a nominal timeline until it comes around again, which is 44 years? In which it's presumably going to come now for Doggett and Scully. Yeah, and that, what I originally was going to say, though, is that whole it's due back in that amount of time until they come for Doggett and Scully. This just squeeze again, because that's the whole tombs this whole thing again. Mm. Five murders, goes dormant, comes back and does it again. Well, we can only assume that this thing hibernates as well, because you don't have the idea of it kills so many people and goes to sleep. So that's what we're assuming, given it previously you know, killed five people or whatever it was and then disappeared for a length of time. I think that's around what it's trying to suggest, but it's actually botched because you don't have the timeline. I mean, really, you should have had it going back. That news headline should have come from a long time back or something, or there'd been older ones. Or they could keep feeding them back, so, like Mulder did in Squeeze, Yeah, where you can say, oh, this happened 44 years ago. If we look back 44 more years, there's another one of these. Yeah. There's been an observed thing, and we know it actually does happen, where people are writing episodes that refer to specific events and they haven't gone and rewatched the relevant episode, which mm. specifically is Samantha's abduction, which yeah. Little Green Men just threw out so many details of and caused an irreconcilable contradiction in the plot. No one, Chris Carter didn't go <laughs> watch Squeeze. He said, I'm going to rewrite Squeeze and didn't bother watching it again. Mm. I will say I like the atmosphere of Patience. It does have a very dark, very foreboding feel to it. I just think it needed a couple more rewrites. Yes. Unfortunately, given it's the showrunner, I don't know who would be able to say, Chris, no, mm. go back and do it again. Do we have anything else for this episode, or would you like to go on the road? Time for a road trip. Road trip with Wile E. Coyote. If only. Meet me. Can you, actually, can you imagine a weird X-Files episode of Walter and Scully investigating sightings of this coyote who appears to just be assembling machines and everything and you have a really long payoff till the roadrunner shows up you have their first kind of murdery scene at the start where it's just a sheer cliff face with a kind of hole punched in it in the shape of a running man yeah that kind of thing yeah but it just slowly build it up to reveal it's just a road bugs a roadrunner and wily coyote reference i don't know how you make this work without giving the game away too early or just be ludicrous but mm. roadrunners though was directed by Rob Hardy, written by Vince Gilligan. Hooray, he's still here. And first broadcast on the 26th of November, 2000. Guest stars, William O'Leary played the gas station man. That's his only name. <laughs> you know him for Candyman, Feral to the Flesh. I can't picture who he is, but I'll take your word for it. Also Terminator 3. So I think the first one you've all seen him in. Lawrence Pressman, who played Mr. Millsap, who was in Star Trek Deep Space Nine and American Pie. Then we have Rusty Swimmer, who played the female bus driver. She was in Highlander 2. There isn't Highlander 2. I know. Candyman. I think I can point to which one. She, she was a police officer in Candyman. Okay. He, she was also in Jason Goes to Hell, The Final Friday. <laughs> I've seen that film too. Twister. Yeah. And one that I thought was interesting, for very vague reasons, is she was in Picket Fences. Oh, okay. That series was going to cross over mm. into this. Fresh Prince of Bel-Air, Better Call Saul, and The Guardians of the Galaxy Holiday Special. Oh, I love that. So, can you tell us about running on roads, coyotes, roadrunners, or if Fanny knows, alien slugs? Meet me. Meet me. Okay, our episode this time opens in the middle of the desert near Sugarville in Utah. We follow a hitchhiker who is catching a ride from a passing bus. This bus seems a bit odd. Nobody on it seems to be talking to each other or him or really acknowledge him when he gets on. The one thing he does notice is a very sick-looking man at the front on crutches. 
The bus drives for a while and then stops without explanation. Uh, the hitchhiker follows as everybody files off the bus, leading the Manning crutches to a clearing where they stone him to death. Seconds later, the hitchhiker trips as he tries to escape, and the other passengers of the bus surround him. Shortly afterwards, Scully arrives on the scene to investigate the murder of the man with crutches. She is curious about this for the X-Files because the victim was apparently 22 years old, but his body shows the signs of kind of arthritis and other bone disease, usually associated with someone in their 80s. After investigating the scene, she heads to a payphone to phone in with Doggett, who she has left without. He's still back at the FBI headquarters. He asks her if she can check over the X-Files for cases mentioning glycoproteins, referring to some weird mucus she found at the site of the murder. As she discusses her case with Doggett, she sees a bus pass by, and she follows it to a gas station in the middle of a desert, in a small community that she didn't otherwise know was there. She speaks to the owner of the gas station, who is a man with a badly injured hand, revealing when she checks his wounds that she is a medical doctor. He offers to fill her car with gas, but it turns out very shortly when her car breaks down that he has laced the gasoline heavily with water. Scully eventually returns to the gas station and has it out with this man, who claims that rain must have got into the gas canister. Scully is sceptical, of course, because they're in the middle of a desert. The gas attendant claims that very few people in town have phones or indeed cars. The only person with a working phone is Mr Milksap, who owns a kind of boarding house on the corner of town. However, when Scully goes to try Mr Milksap's phone, she discovers the line is dead. Scully is offered a room at the boarding house, but she turns it down, trying the rest of town only to find that she is ignored by everybody else as she tries to ask for help. They all seem to be engrossed in private Bible study groups. Eventually, she is forced to spend the night at the boarding house, but sleeps sitting upright with her gun close at hand. The following morning, Mr Milksap comes to Scully having learnt she is a doctor. He claims there is a man downstairs who needs her help. When Scully goes to help him, we as the audience see that the man having a bad seizure is the hitchhiker from the opening, the man that was surrounded by people on the bus. She manages to stabilise the gentleman, but advises the villagers that they need to get him to hospital urgently. They once again claim that nobody has any cars and they can't do so, but asks her to help him. Scully examines the man and discovers this strange, large, circular wound on his lower back, and also is slightly disturbed by the weird, reverent way that the people in the village seem to treat him, as if you know his survival is deeply important to them. Meantime, Doggett calls the local sheriff, believing Scully to be there to report what he's found about glycoproteins. He learns that Scully has not yet arrived, even though they were expecting her the previous day. Due to this, Doggett sets out to find her. As the pearly man recovers from his seizure, Scully talks to him while the townspeople are gone. He seems to be suffering from amnesia. He has no idea who he is or how he came to be in the town. As Scully inspects his wound again, she finds this strange lump that is moving up along the man's spine. As she digs into his open wound, she pulls out what looks like a large chunk of some kind of worm. Scully talks with the hitchhiker about the creature and how she believes that she can't get it out without killing him. Scully eventually leaves to find a car, leaving the stranger her gun so he can protect himself if the villagers return. However, moments after she's left, we see that his entire demeanor changes. When the townspeople enters, he kind of proves that he's actually one of them. He explains what Scully is doing and that he is deteriorating faster than expected, so another swap will be needed. In the meantime, we see that Doggett has arrived in Utah and informed the sheriff about X-Files involving similar back wounds and death by stoning. Scully is quickly captured by the townspeople, who hold her down and insert the worm, a large slug-like creature, into her body. She is tied down to the bed and told repeatedly by the villagers what an honour it is for her, that she will eventually become one with this creature, and of course cease to be Scully. Doggett eventually arrives and speaks to the villagers outside the house. Scully is gagged and cannot warn him, however she does manage to kick over a lamp, starting a large fire. Unfortunately Doggett doesn't see this and leaves as the fire is put out, however we see in his car that he was suspicious of the behaviour of the town folk, believing that they're all lying to him, and calls the police to that location. Unable to wait for police support, Doggett breaks into the house and manages to find Scully. He escapes with her, hiding in the bus from the opening kill, and 
notices the worm moving up her back. Scully informs him that he's got to remove it right away before it can reach her brain. In a rather grisly manner, Doggett does cut into Scully's neck and manage to pull out the creature. As the townsfolk arrive, he shoots it dead. This is much to the town folk's horror. They all behave as though Doggett has killed their god. At the end of the episode, Scully is in hospital, having recovered, but is clearly quite traumatised. As she is packing up her things, Doggett arrives and tells her about the trial of the cult members. They are offering little in their defence, except for the fact they claim that they are persecuted for their religious beliefs. Scully muses about the fact that they thought that the worm was the second coming of Jesus Christ, and apologised to Doggett for going out on the mission alone, promising that she will never do so again. Thank you. It's a grisly, grisly episode. It's so dark, especially yeah. by X-Files terms. <laughs> yeah, and I think this is a better early illustration of the dynamic between um, Doggett and Scully than Patience. I feel this should have really come first, yes. as she's already had a mission with Doggett, and then she ditches him. It would make more sense for her to have ditched him in the previous episode. Yeah, and I kind of like, I don't know if it's intended or not, there's her whole insistence that this isn't really a case she's just been asked to consult on something, but it, it does read like she doesn't want this new partner, so she's going to go off and do things on her own. Mm. Not not to have any time for this new this new guy who's replaced Mulder. So it really should have come before Patience, then? Absolutely. I don't understand why this was in this order. Apparently, this episode did get a lot of people's backs up purely for the ending scene with Doggett and Scully, because they feel Doggett is very patronising to her. It's something that Robert Patrick has defended, saying it's not intended to be patronising. The intent was for more him to reassure Scully, kind of in the marine sense of, you know, I'd jump on a grenade for you, you can trust me. Yeah, I can see that, but I can also see it being difficult to get the tone of that right. It used to be an early season problem with Scully being kidnapped. We're now on about the 87th <laughs> Scully kidnapping of the series. Yeah. But it's the same idea, I guess, is Scully can't get out of this alone, which you can read as it's the importance of having a partner. This is why FBI agents are supposed to work in pairs. Absolutely. But at the same time, she gets in a situation that she can't get out of and the new man has to come and save her. Yeah. It's... um. Difficult to overlook that one, unfortunately. Mm. As much as otherwise, it's a very effective little horror piece. I mean, we talked about Morgan and Wong a lot for Patience, and this is exactly the kind of thing they might have written. Yeah, it's quite a surprise that it's Vince Gilligan, who we said it before is one of the best X-Files writers. And, you know, this again is a very well-written episode, but you normally kind of expect blackly comical character pieces from Vince Gilligan. Apparently, this was deliberately written by him because he wanted to do something that was against his type. Uh, so he wanted to make the kind of grisliest, scariest, <laughs> darkest thing he could. Yeah, it was interesting given his last episode was Just Sweat. <laughs> You've gone from Just Sweat to this. Mm. Which is, uh, it's got a lot of the body horror stuff. I mean, there's a lot of ice in here. Yeah, I, I think it's unfair. Paula Vitaris in particular slammed this episode because she saw it as being a rehash of ice. I wouldn't really say so. It's a very different parasite and it's a very different kind of feel to the episode. Yeah, well, the whole point of ice is it's like the thing, it's turning on your nominal friends because you don't know who you can trust. Mm. This is, Scully is in the middle of a group of people she cannot trust. She knows she cannot trust them, but she's overwhelmed and overpowered. I think it doesn't have the comedic e edge of home, but the episode it made me think of most was that. Because it's this idea of an insular kind of backwater community. I can see that. Mm. Who um, think they found the second coming of Christ. It's a great honour to be the new host. I kind of love the idea that the second coming of Christ would not be a human. It would be <sighs> this parasitic worm. Uh, the creature's design was actually based on a banana slug. Oh, okay. Which, if you look them up, are hell of a cute. Yeah. <laughs> but you can kind of see it in the shape. It is a very slug-like, big, thick-bodied, slimy creature. Yeah. I mean, that does cause a lot of questions about things like Revelation. I thought he was the second coming of Christ. No, it was the Worm Emperor it's all the worm along. Emperor, the worm, the worm Emperor. One thing I do feel the episode kind of overlooks, or maybe just leaving it up to the implication, is this cult keeps saying it's going to be a great honour for you to become the new host. No, no, they were volunteering. No, oh, funny that. <laughs> Isn't it just? They go random people from the side of the road and hope it will turn out for the best rather than you know, having someone and maybe having a doctor look them over first. It's the kind of scary sort of parasite horror as well, because this is 
once it reaches your brain, it's irreversible. Yeah, it's, it's like kind the countdown. Of, it's like the uh, fungus in The Last of Us. Yeah. That once it's taken root, it's there. It's not like Anmorphs, the Yerks, which can be removed and you're absolutely fine. Yeah. The idea of the trill in Star Trek, which, yes, when it's in you, it's in you. However, you still retain your sense of self. Or the things in Star Trek 2, again, the brain, the, um, the manipulating things. Oh, the thing he puts in Chekhov. Yeah. Mm. Because that, that, that sort of just decides to leave of its own volition and then yeah. go shoot it. But anyway, mm. I don't know why we're thinking about Star Trek 2 so much. I mean, it's a complete mystery to me. I, do, I like the mystery of the episode and how unsubtle the townsfolk are. I mean, there's no real attempt to make you believe that Scully isn't in trouble as soon as she arrives in this little community. No. Because the gas station man is hella suspicious the second he starts speaking. And she's also rightfully suspicious of him, but there's nothing to pin down what he's doing that's weird, other than filling her car with water, but she can't know that until it's too late. That was clearly just happened to be rainwater in the middle of the desert. Oh yeah, uh, the, the rainwater must go into that can. How? I mean, first off, you know, there's not a lot of rain. Otherwise, that's not a can you've left open to the air. Mm-hmm. And uh, do you leave? You have the lack of urgency of everyone and how unhelpful they are. Like, oh, do you have a phone? No, only Mr. Milsop has a phone. And then the phone's broken. It's like, oh dear, the phone is broken. <laughs> Guess you'll have to stay the night. It, so, it's very slow burn horror. It's very kind of wicker man build up to it. Yeah, I mean, I'd say one of the, the weirdest bit, although I imagine it's basically the cult coming to venerate the god and everything, is when Scully is paranoid and got her gun ready and you see the village starting to congregate. Mm. And then nothing happens. Yeah, I'm guessing they must be going downstairs and talking to their new, new found god. Mm. Well, according to the Wikipedia article, is called Hank, but I'm yes. not sure we hear his name. Oh spoke. no, we do. We do because we find that there's a missing person poster that Doggett finds. Ah, uh, is that where it says that's, Hank? Yeah, that's the last person to use the payphone before Scully does. Oh, okay, so he did have a name in the episode. He did have a name in the episode. It's kind of blink and miss it because he's he doesn't actually own up to having that name. But I mean, I do feel that. That whole thing of, you know, Scully might be the perfect host or they've run into a problem because this guy is diabetic or suffering from seizures or possibly both. Because I think he's got, there's definitely an inference he's diabetic, isn't there? Is there? Because he's not been getting um, his medication or something. But when Scully sniffs him, she says he doesn't smell like pears, which would infer he's not diabetic. Yeah, so I'm not sure entirely what his problem with him. you know, when diabetic people start to go hypo, they tend to smell very sweet. Okay. That's what she was sniffing him for. Uh. Well, she was making guesses at the time anyway. Yeah, it's a good medical PSA yeah. <laughs> for anyone listening, in fact, because um, the symptoms of hyposhock when you're diabetic look a lot like someone who's drunk. So especially on nights out, you know, it often gets discounted until it's too serious. Oh, uh, okay. But if somebody, it's, it's often described as pear drops, this really, really sweet scent that diabetic people give off when they're hypo. So, you know, if they're behaving like they're drunk and you can smell that, it's probably time to get the ambulance in. Okay. But there you are, medical PSA for you. Thank you. So these are meant to be a kind of crazy cult, but at the same time, it does it does it not feel like picking up random people off the side of the road not going to be your best way of perpetuating this divine right you've got? I imagine if it needs to change hosts fairly regularly, which it seems to do so, given the previous guy was only missing for a matter of months before they had to stone him. Yeah. That in their close-knit community, they can't keep sacrificing members because by the end of the year, they would have halved their community. I suppose so, but then you've got the risk of you just get a really bad host. Mm. The one thing that's just you made me think is, um, while we kind of accept that you've got to kill the original host and then tear it out of them, mm. they do kind of stove his head in, and this is a parasite that needs access to the brain, and is there not some risks there? You think that maybe trepanning him might be a bit safer or something? Yeah, or some other way of murdering them that's not going to damage his head so much where the parasite... I'm going to kind of assume, like most parasites, is once it reaches the brain, it's kind of stuck there. Yeah. So you've got to cut the head to get it out. Yeah, which means going through bone and stuff, doesn't Mm. it? It, I think it's the whole grisly aesthetic rather than any kind of medical plausibility to it. If you look at the size of that thing as well, it's not very realistic to think of it being rooted in a brain anyway. Or just going along the skin under your spine and not just being... Yeah, there's something on your spine, dude. What's wrong with you? Think of it in terms of if it's gone along your spine, it would presumably cause horrible damage as well. Like that thing in the Resident Evil movie. You know, there's the animated movie where they manage to save a guy, but it paralyses him. Oh, Because yeah. the thing's rooted yeah, in Leon, his spine. <laughs> Leon shot the Les Plagas out of the guy. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Oh, it was Plagas. It was Plagas, it? Yeah. it was. 
But again, it was the, I'm sorry, it's taken root in your spine. We can save you, but you're not going to come out of this well. Yeah, but you can't do that to Scully, I think. No, I guess not. Easily. I mean, you could have done, well, but... Because when we down. say the thing's going up her spine, it's literally sliding up the outside of her spine, not going through it. Yeah. And the fact that she can block it by just gripping the back of her neck is an interesting bit. Mm. That was an interesting prosthetic shot, actually, because, of course, the banana slug itself is an animatronic. You know, you can tell from the way they move, it's a physical thing. Yeah. So what they created was a kind of fiberglass back for Scully. So essentially she was lying on the bed, tied down, which she said was actually a really exhausting role to play because you're on your stomach and constantly having to strain. Yeah. The fiberglass panel goes over her back and then it's they kind of have the animatronic under it moving. Oh, okay. So you get that effect of a kind of like raised bump moving under her skin. Oh. It's quite clever. I think you had a note of, hey, we've seen Scully's back for the first time in a long time. Is there something missing from this um, p- patch of skin? Oh, yes, I didn't notice this. But when I was Googling it, I noticed someone talking about Gaff in the episode. And it's the fact that in Never Again, she got the uh, Ouroboros tattoo. Yeah. That we see Scully's bare back quite a lot in this episode <laughs> and there is no Ouroboros. Their theory was after the events of Never Again, she would have obviously had this tattoo removed. But I'm pretty sure they don't perfectly remove them without leaving any scarring. Yeah, I imagine there's a mottled patch of skin where you can't see what it was because you can tell was there. Yeah. I mean, this is the evergreen comment we've had for so many year- years now of, we're pretty sure there's a Bible, we're pretty sure people aren't reading it. Because mm. you'd think you'd read, you'd be have a reference to, does Scully have a tattoo? Yes, you've got one here. Mm. Maybe it was removed, but the makeup department have to do something to account for it. I'm this. pretty sure by the time we got to this point in the series as well, we were into the DVD era of the X-Files, so it would have been easier to re-watch these old episodes. Yeah, I mean... I know. Yes. By the time I got to about season seven, they were bringing out the DVD box sets in the UK because I was slowly, as a teenager, buying the earlier ones that I hadn't seen. Yeah. I mean, we talked about this a bit at the time in that the early X-Files stuff was two episodes per tape and to get a season's worth, that's two episodes per tape for 13 tapes or so. Mm. The switch to DVDs just compressed space and time and money so much. So what we're saying is it's not a good excuse for why no one apparently working on this series remembered she had a tattoo. It was a new director, to be fair. I don't think he's directed any previous ones. That's true, but isn't this the whole point of you, this is why you have your showrunner around? Yeah. Because they're meant to know these things. And Vince Gilligan has also been like on the producer, production kind of credits since season three, which is right in the right time frame to do this. Mm. Vince, I'm disappointed. But otherwise, I like the episode. Oh, yeah, I really enjoyed this one. It's a really, really effective slow burn horror. And unlike Patience, it does make you feel uncomfortable. Yes. Vince Gilligan succeeded, I think. He did kind of make an episode that would get under your skin. Literally. Yeah, I, I, I love the slug as well. <laughs> I, I kind know. of want one. That scene where he removed it from Scully is one of the nastiest scenes I've ever seen in the X-Files. It's really, really gruesome. It is. I mean, I'm, in some ways I'm surprised Scully survived that. Mm. Given you had to sort of uh, cut her neck and then rip her thing right out of it. It's not just the kind of horror, you know, the visceral horror of having an insect under your skin, the gore, and Scully screaming blue murder the entire time. Yep. As the cultists are outside the windows banging on the glass as well, it's a really, really nasty sequence. It's probably rating high in the nastiest sequences we've seen so far. Yeah. So it's, as you said, though, we really can't get past that this should be episode three. Yeah. And, you know, drawing the squeeze comparison was a stupid plan, whereas you could have gone with a bang on this one. And like we said at the start of this one, is it makes much more sense for Scully to be chafing against the newfound obligation, given that if, you know, Doc has just told her that he's now got to work with her, and the first thing she does is run off on her own. Yeah. That all flows through so much more nicely. I guess the only hope is now that we've got this out of Scully's system and we can focus on a partnership and not just more trying to, I don't know, pretend dog it doesn't exist. Yeah. And as you said, again, it's, patience makes us weird. We, I, I can't believe this is still a problem that keeps happening of if you just had these episodes in a different order, you wouldn't have these weird effects happening. Mm. Yet you do. And this isn't even the usual one of Half the time it was conspiracy stuff was causing the problem. These are just Monster of the Week episodes that are now causing weirdness. Yeah. Do we have much else for this one? Because it is, it's grisly, it's gory, it's not funny really at all, but it is very effective. It's 
very, very uncomfortable. Yes. Very scary. And I think, I suppose you could say it's a good sign that season eight at least has some more potential than you might have thought by the end of season seven. Because season seven was very much a case of why won't it end? And this is the whole, okay, so you can still shock us. That's good. Mm. It's true that when you look at the kind of contemporary feedback of the series, people kind of wanted Doggett to fail. They weren't very forthcoming, especially fans, you know, did not want to accept him, didn't want him to be there, were willing to pick fault at anything they could. And it's kind of nice in a way to see that we can still get good episodes at this point. I suppose that's something we did mention, is that the intro has changed again. So this is our third variant of the intro sequence, mm. with uh, Mulder removed from the start, and Julian Anderson pumped up and Robert Patrick being the other photo. Yeah. But if we have nothing else for Roadrunners... No, I think that's everything. So next time we get Invocation and Red Rum. And I remember one of these two episodes. I can remember both of them. Yeah, I just have a, a blind spot on Invocation. I think you told me which one it is and I went, Oh! I don't know what happens. <laughs> if you'd like to get hold of us and our AI email address is things are getting strange 42 at gmail.com. You can also find us on social media and do hook me up if you'd like us to promote anything at the start of our show as Kevin J. Anderson did last week. You can find us on Twitter and Tumblr at GetStrange42, on Mastodon at GetStrange42 at Universedon.com, or on Facebook where you can find us by searching for Things Are Getting Strange in X-Files Rewatch Podcast. Also, if you're not sick of my voice right now, I do have a stream on Twitch TV called Adverse Camber 42, where I just stream whatever I'm currently playing on PlayStation 5. My regular streaming days are Mondays and Wednesdays at 8pm GMT and Saturdays at 5pm GMT. I'm currently playing Danganronpa 2 Goodbye Despair, Cyberpunk 2077 and Silent Hill 2. Also, if you follow my Adverse Camber 42 Twitter, I'll give you the heads up if I'm going to pop on any other days as on top of the scheduled ones. We have a Patreon, patreon.com slash things are getting strange, where you can find our Let's Play of the first X-Files game, our reviews of Goblins and Whirlwind, and possibly not quite when you hear this, but shortly afterwards, will be our review of Ground Zero by Kevin J. Anderson, which we're totally not going to record in a few minutes' time. For as little as three dollars a month, you can have access to every, all of our little bonus bits and pieces, and uh, any donations are gratefully received to help us keep the lights on and pay your bills. Our theme music is envisioned by Kevin McLeod. You can find it on Competech.com, licensed under Creative Commons by Attribution 3.0. Thank you all for listening, and until next time, please remember you're, you're going, going to be, be so loved. loved.